Welcome. I'd like to welcome everybody um, to this conversation. My name is Marjorie Fee. Um, I'm an emeritus professor of English. Um, and I think my first duty is to acknowledge that we are on the uh, traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Musqueam people here at UBC Vancouver. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that you are here from near and far from many places and uh, acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. Please note uh, this uh, conversation is being recorded uh, for archival purposes and uh, will be on the website of the Emeritus College. Um, you'll get a link once it's been posted. The format for today is that we have three presentations, uh, each person having around five minutes to speak. And at the end of that, uh, we will have um, 15 minutes of discussion among the uh, panelists. Uh, then after that, there'll be a general Q&A, which I will moderate um, uh, by the chat room. And then after that, you will be randomly assigned to breakout rooms after the meeting. If you have a preference for which breakout room you'd like to go to, you can indicate your preference in the chat. Um, to uh, introduce myself, um, I've been working uh, most recently in Indigenous Studies, and I've written a book about polar bears, uh, which seems like a deviation from the norm, but um, I could explain it, it really isn't. Um, however, I'm more interested in getting to the discussion. So I'd like to start uh, the, the, the discussion. The three speakers are Doe Stain, Tim McDaniels, and Bill Winder, and I'm going to introduce them separately just before they um, have their little moment. So Doe Stain is a professor emeritus from Earth, Ocean and Atmospheric Scientist, uh, sorry, Sciences. And he's an interdisciplinary environmental scholar uh, with interest in air pollution and boundary layer and mesoscale meteorolo meteorology. So Doe, um, please let us hear what you have to say. Thank you, Marjorie. Oh, you've muted yourself. Somebody muted me. Oh. <laughs> um, so in five minutes, to explain climate change is a tall order, I shall give it a go. Uh, firstly, we know as an empirical fact that globally averaged near surface atmospheric temperatures have increased and increased dramatically, dramatically compared to past temperature increases or, or decreases for that matter. The current change is approximately one degree C higher than the pre-industrial temperatures. Fact number one. Number two, an empirical fact. Uh, global atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations have increased dramatically relative to past rates. Again, the change, rate of change has been very fast. Increased from the pre-industrial level of about 280 parts per million in the atmosphere to a present level of 380 parts per million. Number three, we know both theoretically and empirically that planetary temperatures, and by that I mean the temperatures of all planets in our solar system that we have studied, are governed by the radiative trapping of solar radiation. This trapping is governed by greenhouse gases. On our planet, water, carbon dioxide, methane, and a few others. Without this effect, Earth's surface temperature would be minus 18 Celsius rather than the current 14 Celsius. So we have 32 odd degrees of greenhouse effect. It's part of our, the way Earth works. Venus is a stinker. It has about 270 degrees of greenhouse effect, largely due to clouds of methane and, and, and chlorine. Um, so greenhouse effect is no great mystery and it's present and on every planet. Mars has just about none because it has no atmosphere worth talking of. We also know empirically that the vast majority of the carbon dioxide injected into the atmosphere since the industrial era has come from human use of fossil fuels used in order to produce energy. Climate scientists have concluded beyond reasonable doubt that the human emitted carbon dioxide is the cause of this warming I've spoken of. 
And that warming will continue unabated unless we're able to bring the carbon dioxide concentrations down to safer levels. We also know that a whole range of global climates have changed in concert with this global temperature change. So these changes are wide ranging, uh, involving both space and time changes and intensity changes, storm intensity, storm frequency, uh, sea level rise, a whole panoply of, cl of global climate changes. It's not just global warming or heating, if you want to call it that. So these changes unquestionably threaten to alter the many features of Earth that have a strong influence on human habitation. We know also empirically that about half of the carbon dioxide has gone into solution in the oceans of half of what we've emitted. So the oceans have become acidified. And moreover, if we were to draw down atmospheric carbon dioxide, the carbon dioxide is, that has gone into solution in the oceans would simply come out of solution and re-enter the atmosphere. This process injects a multi-decade response time in the climate system. The atmospheric lifetime of carbon dioxide is approximately 100 years at the very least. So it is important to recognize that climate change will proceed in an irregular manner. It's not a lockstep warming intensification. There'll be gradual deviations from the present conditions and they will occur in a stochastic nature. In other words, it'll be a random, apparently random process, but it will inevitably be in one direction. That's what the climate scientists know. And by know, I mean very carefully the way scientists know something beyond reasonable doubt. What we do not understand is how the solutions to this problem can be implemented. What are the economic, social, and psychological changes that are needed to human society in order to contain, let alone reverse, this global climate change driven by the accumulating atmospheric carbon dioxide. So there's the thumbnail sketch. And I end deliberately with the unknowns. We climate scientists can tell you what is happening and to a certain extent what is needed to reverse what is happening. There are engineers who will point to the nature of the technological solutions, but the social, psychological and economic matters remain a mystery to us climate scientists. And that's why we have Tim here and Bill here to talk to us about those parts. Thank you, Marjorie. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, now I'd like to turn to Tim McDaniels. Um, he's a professor emeritus from Community and Regional Planning, a fellow of the Society for Risk Analysis, and he has worked for decades on risk and decision-making in environmental and technology contexts. So Tim. Well, first of all, uh, let me thank the Emeritus College for this invitation. Uh, normally I'd be happy to do a talk like this, but to be honest, talking about climate change is an awkward thing to do if you have to address the uh, policy, decision-making uh, and uh, psychological dimensions as Doe has mentioned. In very brief terms, the climate crisis we face, it's, it's probably better to call it climate chaos than global warming. The climate crisis, crisis is real, it's enduring, but it's widely misunderstood by the public in terms of the threats and possible ways of addressing those threats. The problem is a very long-term one. I, I wish this were not true, but there is nothing we as Canadians or British Columbians could do in the short term to avoid or reverse climate uh, patterns that are underway. We can adapt to them and we can try and make changes in our society and our energy economy over time, but we have no short term fixes. The reason is because the warming and thus the harm comes from concentrations in the atmosphere, not just current emissions. As Doe says, CO2 stays in the atmosphere for more than a century and ultimately uh, ends up at the bottom of the ocean. The CO2 that's being uh, 
sort of deposited now at the bottom of the ocean in rough terms was emitted in about 1920. We have a hundred years more warming to get rid of in terms of the concentrations in the atmosphere. And all the commitments currently made in international agreements among all nations only slow the rate of growth of con concentrations by modest amounts. They do not reverse concentrations. So in that vein, I think it's, it's a bit awkward to say that we have until 2050 to avoid two degrees C warming in terms of global temperature averages. It may be too late for that already. On the other hand, we should make all reasonable progress in trying to reduce emissions as soon as possible. And we should pay close attention to learning how to do that better over time through innovation in technology and innovations in governance, among other things. People talk about trade-offs between economic and uh, 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 objectives and climate. In my view, the economic system is enormously resilient to changes in energy prices and big shocks of all kinds. It's ecological systems that are not nearly so resilient. And that is why uh, uh, species loss, threats of extinction and disruptions of ecological systems on a very large scale are a grave threat in coming decades and centuries. To reduce atmosphere concentrations in meaningful ways, we need a whole new energy system, not just a greener version of our current energy system. And that takes time. And that also requires innovations and markets that work effectively. One huge issue worth uh, highlighting in terms of climate is equity among groups. Now, there are many different lines uh, in which we could consider equity and fairness concerns, but one that tends to be largely unrecognized here in the West is the need for the developing world to continue to use energy and effectively pour cement, because that's very energy intensive, uh, to achieve their development goals. And so in order to leave some room in the atmosphere for emissions uh, that uh, other countries uh, in the developing world may need to develop their economies, we here in the West would have to reduce our per capita consumption of energy by over an order of magnitude. Carbon taxes are widely supported by economists and we here in British Columbia are seen as the envy of the world and actually having had a carbon tax for some time. But let me ask you this, has anyone on this call actually had their behavior affected by the short-term price of energy in BC where we have a carbon tax? In general, people go to the gas tanks, uh, fill their gas tanks, they make their capital investments and they don't really pay much attention to the price of energy. My colleague Hadi Dalit Badi, a CRC chair uh, here at UBC, argues that excise taxes may well work better in changing energy consumption investments over time. For example, in Denmark, they have a 150% tax, excise tax on new cars to limit the uh, interest in spending on new cars. I will uh, finish up with perhaps a, a vision of hope on the horizon and point to some work of uh, our uh, academic colleagues, uh, specifically the work of carbon engineering at, at the wood fiber pulp mill site in Howe Sound. The, this project is headed by David Keith, who is now of Harvard and formerly of the University of Calgary certainly showed a lot of interest in UBC when he was looking for jobs. Uh, and this company has designed a system to draw CO2 directly out of the atmosphere. It's called direct carbon capture. It requires a lot of electricity to work. And if this technology proves to work at scale, then one can imagine uh, offshore wind generation platforms combined with direct carbon removal 
to begin to reduce concentrations. That's the vision and the hope of the future. But to be frank, it's, we face a lot of disruption from climate change over decades and centuries. And we can only try and incrementally learn how to address this problem better over time. Thanks. Thanks very much, Tim. Um, I'll now turn to Bill Winder, um, who uh, classifies himself as the Candide of this group. Uh, you may have to do a little bit of French language homework to figure out what that means. Um, he is uh, from French, Hispanic and Italian studies and uh, he, as a French language instructor and digital humanities specialist, he didn't have much connection to climate change, but he is now moving into that area as an activist. And uh, his, his purpose is to actually forward um, the, the reduction, I guess, of carbon and, and work on the car, uh, climate change uh, issue. So, Bill. Oh, you're muted, Bill. There we are. Okay, okay, I think I'm unmuted now. Yes, you are. Um, good. Uh, I think uh, Tim kind of gave me an introduction. I'm the public um, in the sense that I <clears throat> read the documents that are out there. And one of them uh, is uh, Seth Klein's uh, newest book, uh, A Good War. And I read the materials of Extinction Rebellion <clears throat> without any particular um, expertise in the climate as such. Um, Klein uses the uh, World War II as a blueprint for a radical transformation of society. And I understand him, a way to think of this is to understand him calling for a Churchill response to the climate crisis where everything is on the table <clears throat> rather than a Chamberlain response where there is a kind of compromise solution. Um, XR, the Extinction Rebellion, um, as the name in indicates, is a uh, kind of a grassroots roots, uh, movement to um, uh, get society to accept this Churchill style mobilization. Uh, <clears throat> now, I know the word war is a very charged uh, word and has a lot of uh, bad resonance. But um, in some ways, the, the, there are many ways in which the climate crisis is a war and really on several levels. I mean, the first way is that um, we are going to lose. <laughs> every war, everybody loses. And in the climate crisis, we will lose. There will be sacrifice and in fact, great sacrifice. Um, it's always a question of, um, in the case of uh, the Churchill style response to a war of trying to lose less. And that's all we can really hope for. Um, I really think of it as climate wars, plural. Um, the new book by Michael Mann is the, the new climate war. Um, but I think of it as the plural because really there are several um, conflicts that are combining. And one of them are the real wars uh, that are sparked by uh, climate disasters. And the kind of classic case is the Syrian war where there were several years of drought before the, um, the civil war. And uh, there have been much debate about it, but it's fairly clear that the drought uh, caused uh, or was the climate was the war enhancer <laughs> and that uh, where you can't say that was the only cause, it was a major component of the of the Syrian war. So those are the real wars and there'll be war like devastation by hurricanes, drought and fires. We've been breathing the smoke recently. Uh, in 2018, there were 17.2 million people were displaced by weather disasters. And this is clearly going to get worse. And there's a political conflict over regulation. And this is a kind of war as well. It's between, on the one hand, industry-led uh, climate deniers. For 50 years, the fossil fuel industry has spent, I would say, millions, if not billions of dollars um, denying uh, climate science. And on the other hand, there are land and water protectors who are trying to block emissions and block the um, development of fossil fuels. And this is called blockadia. Um, and this, this is really a moral conflict 
over regulation, but it's not at all bloodless uh, in the sense that over 200 land and uh, water protectors were murdered um, last year. Um, my, oops, let me make sure I can get here. Um, so far we have, and this is, uh, Sandra, if you could put up that image, um, so far we have a Chamberlain style response with a lot of treaties and agreements um, to win these, uh, but the richest and the most powerful 10% of the world uh, would have to sacrifice their lifestyle and so actually nothing has been done. Um, I don't know if we have our, uh, my graph up there, here we are, okay. Um, these are all the agreements that have been um, proposed so far, and it's almost as if the agreements are causing climate change, because every time there's a new agreement, the um, carbon in the air goes up. Uh, Kevin and Anderson gives, a, this is a problem about wealth inequality, because um, this is a kind of an example given by Kevin Anderson, uh, that if the wealthiest 10% of the planet live like the average European, there would be a 33% drop in emissions. This isn't going to happen. And we kind of understand why, and we've seen that with the pandemic, uh, when the politicians say we should stay at home, then go to Hawaii, we understand that the, uh, the richest 10%, unfortunately we are in that category, um, do not want to give up their um, lifestyle. And there is a um, um, loss aversion, <laughs> which would make it very difficult to ask uh, this wartime um, commitment uh, of especially the top 10% because the bottom is already living in um, living with evictions and living within difficult circumstances. So what does what is the activist response and I uh, is basically it is to block business as usual and that's blockadia and we've had we have industry that has really captured governments and has mounted a very well-funded campaign to prevent climate action. Um, so the question is, uh, what do you do in this situation? And uh, historically, the suffragettes and the abolitionists um, and the civil rights movement, the, the answer was uh, civil disobedience. And this is what um, Extinction Rebellion is suggesting. Um, well, is actually more than suggesting, they're actually uh, participating in, promoting. Um, and we are having, I guess, an increased, <laughs> increased number of protests such as Standing Rock and the Wet'suwet'en protests or blockade um, in the North and the Unistoten, an increasing number um, where the goal is to disrupt uh, the fossil fuel industry and the financial industry as well. Um, the most kind of dramatic was when the, what are called the valve turners, uh, turned off um, all the uh, tar sands oil going to the United States. Now, what I think is interesting about that, they were charged for all, everything, everything you can imagine, terrorism, um, you know, burglary, everything. Well, your, your time is up, can you okay. wrap up these things? And all I'd like to say there uh, to wrap up is simply that they, they, when they're in the courts, they plead the, the, um, the necessity of defense, that there is a immediate need to um, respond to the climate uh, crisis. And they are now, at least three times they've gotten off. <laughs> That'll be it for me. Thanks very much, Bill. Mm -hmm. All right, at this point, um... We are opening for questions and we have about 15 minutes. Um, I have the first question I think from our, uh, Richard Spencer would like to speak uh, to Tim. I, I ask Richard if you're unmuted to tell him what you want to say. Yes, thank you very much. And I appreciate the, the contributions of each of the speakers and this is clearly an emergency and it is clearly extraordinarily difficult to make progress in the direction that we need to make it. But from my point of view, um, two of the speakers, certainly Tim and Bill, um, contributed to what I think is a, is a very significant 
misunderstanding and, and it puts those who would like to see the climate emergency dealt with in a negative, a necessarily negative position. Tim said um, that to achieve the results we're looking for, and I, I'm quoting you more or less, uh, we would have to reduce our per capita energy consumption uh, by, I think you said 10 times or to 10%, I'm not sure. Uh, Bill said that um, the wealthiest 10% would have to sacrifice their lifestyle. Now, those things would certainly move us in the direction of solving the climate crisis, but they turn off a lot of people. And in my opinion, there is an alternative and it's not science fiction. The Economist reports that both wind energy and solar oh, energy thanks. can now uh, contribute electrical energy to national grids at a lower cost than coal or gas. And I think our focus should be, at least in part, on persuading the community that other than the damage to the economic interests of people who extract fossil fuels, there's an alternative for the rest of us, which is actually cheaper. We could have more energy for the same price if we were to focus single-mindedly on solar and wind with government effort put behind those alternatives. And the more we use them, the cheaper they will get. And in Canada in particular, where we have significant hydro infrastructure, we can use hydro essentially like a battery because we know that solar and wind are not don't work all the time. That's that's my contribution. I think the focus or an important focus of dealing with climate change is power and energy. It's critical to civilization. It's critical to standard of living. At the moment, it's the major contributor to climate change, but it doesn't have to be. We actually have the tools, technological, scientific, and economic to replace fossil fuels with other means at an economic price if we can devote our energy to the kinds of, on the one hand, terrorist activity, which I think should not be called that and then clearly necessary. And on the other hand, political activity to ensure that the self-interest of the fossil fuel extractors don't so distort and, and um, pervert the picture that the ordinary people have. I think we can do it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I, I skipped a whole stage. You did, for yeah. Our um, speakers are allowed to speak among themselves, but I think that thank you, Richard. You've raised an issue that they may wish to to attend to while they're they're doing that, but they may have other ideas. So um, I'll I'll turn it over to our three speakers uh, to decide what what they what they want to say next. And I apologize. Well, perhaps I could just respond to the previous uh, comments. I, I think there was a question in there uh, and certainly some val uh, important viewpoints. It is true that these days, it seems that offshore wind and solar in the right locations are about the cheapest sources of e electricity we have. And in fact, perhaps the cheapest we've ever had except for big hydro dams. Uh, that's true. That's different than saying we can solve the climate crisis with electricity. We do use liquid fuels for transportation. We can use more electricity for transportation, but the transition period uh, to go from the electrical system we have to an electrical system that uh, also replaces uh, uh, liquid fuels uh, and, and replaces uh, carbon intensive fuels in the electrical sector, that's a long period of time. My colleagues at Carnegie Mellon and I, when I used to work uh, uh, on a NSF funded uh, uh, climate energy decision making center there, uh, estimated that uh, it would take many decades simply to replace the electrical uh, infrastructure that we have now based on coal, if we, even if we just built nuclear plants. Nowadays, we would say nuclear plants are too expensive and uh, unreliable and worrisome. And we do have uh, offshore wind and we have solar, 
You need sites for those. You need transmission lines all over the place to do that. So it's not something that we can just wish out of the air. Uh, the point I've been trying to make is that if this is a long-term problem, and I certainly agree, more solar and more offshore wind are part of the solution. Thanks, Tim. Bill? Well, I have um, first of all, a question for Doe, in fact, and as well, um, a quick remark about the solar. Obviously, everyone applauds solar and uh, wind and um, geothermal and, and so on. Uh, but mo a lot of people believe that the problem is, is earth overshoot. That is, we are simply using too much of the earth's resources and even will point to the pandemic as an earth overshoot problem. That is, we kind of encroach on nature and that's why there are calls for you know, 30% to 50% of the, of the world to be reserved for nature. I think that's, uh, but my question for Doe is that when I, I'm, I, I get rather <laughs> worried about the fact, about specific facts such as um, the, uh, my understanding is that 70% of the summer ice in the Arctic has disappeared in uh, 40 years. And when I see the scale of that, I, you, you say that the rate of change is very fast. Well, very. The question is how fast? And because, you know, um, a, a log is oxidizing, but if it oxidizes very fast, it burns. And so the question is, what is that rate of climate change? So, yes, thank you, Bill. I mean, these are interesting questions. Um, the climate system has built into it inherent time scales of response. And externally, there come forcings which force the climate system to change. One of those forcings is the rate of accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere at the moment as driven by human emissions. And as I said, that rate of increase is way faster than anything that has been seen in the past. Um, certainly in the past 100,000 years or so. In terms of, of evolving climates, we are in unprecedented territory. And you cannot argue at all that, that we could look to the past and see how the Earth climate system handled this because there has never been such a fast forcing. Uh, to that extent, there, there's a degree of uncertainty about exactly how the climate system is going to respond. Many people talk about tipping points. Um, I'm, I'm a little unhappy about the idea, but it's a technical unhappiness. I understand nonlinear systems and nonlinear dynamics. And yes, there are indeed uh, conditions under which a highly nonlinear system can be forced and then suddenly shift off. And by suddenly, I mean in a short time, shift off to a totally different state. And we have in fact seen that in the past in earth climates, uh, famously worked on by E.N. Lorentz, probably the nearest Nobel Prize winner amongst atmospheric scientists, um, well, dynamic atmospheric scientists. So yes, there, there are chances that, that the, these changes can be very fast. Probably the scariest of all has been Wally Broker, who suggested at some stage that it is possible that the climate forcing we're indu in, inducing at the moment could switch the Gulf Stream off. Hmm. The Gulf Stream is just part of the large globe circling thermohaline system that redistributes heat throughout the oceans. And, and as the name implies, heat and salt. Um, the, the Gulf Stream is just a very important part of that, an arm of that circulation. And the Gulf Stream is what means uh, that Paris does not have a climate like Winnipeg. Could you imagine? Could you imagine? <laughs> um, so that, that I'm happy to talk about tipping points in that context, but I, I think the term is overused to a certain extent. Um, the, the interesting thing you mentioned about ice, about Arctic ice, of course, um, floating ice, when it melts, does not change the level of the sea as long as it's only fresh water. It is land fast ice. So in fact, of greater concern is the melting of Antarctic ice, a large fraction of which is supported by the Antarctic continent. And a consequence of that is that um, melting and returning to the oceans, Antarctic ice will produce highly discontinuous bouts of sea level rise. 
with tremendously concerning consequences for low-lying cities. And you can start listing off the low-lying oceanic cities, you know, London, New York, oh, Dhaka, all of the Ganges base, a mouth, uh, you know, terrifying consequences there. Um, so yes, those, those are simply different components of what I said, this broad panoply of climate components that are changing, driven by the carbon dioxide. In, in many ways, the way one should view this is that we as human species have our fingers on a rudder. The rudder is the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And you twiddle the rudder and the whole ship moves. Well, that's what, that's what we are doing. We, we have a, a lever on a powerful full, uh, amplifier. I have a follow-up okay. question, if I um, may. Okay, you may. And then Very I think quick. we'll have to transition, but right. thank you. Okay. It is, um, you know, the, the concern for the Arctic is that a lot of ocean currents depend on the differential in temperature between the water at the Arctic and the water um, at the equator, basically. What happens when there is no ice in the Arctic? Is there any chance that the ocean currents will be affected? Huge chance. Yeah. Yes. Okay. yes, well, that's exactly That's it. really all my, my and <laughs> that's really my question. <laughs> I didn't want to go into the technical details of the thermohaline solution, but the whole thing is driven by cold water, a uh, meltwater from the Arctic in the North, uh, North Atlantic Ocean which is cold and relatively dense and dives under the ocean mm. and initiates the globe circling part of the thermohaline right. solution. So yes. Well, this is frightening. <laughs> yes. For me. Yeah, very hey. briefly on, on the last point of uh, ocean currents and the THC uh, uh, um, uh, cycle. My colleagues at Carnegie Mellon, uh, Granger Morgan and, and his associates elicited probabilities from the world's most knowledgeable experts on this topic a few years ago. And they came up with a, you know, some substantial probability, like notable probability, I can't remember the percent probability, that under various scenarios, yes, we could have a partial failure of uh, the Gulf Stream. Uh, and the disruption to Northern Europe is beyond imagining. But uh, just uh, to echo one last thing, Doe mentioned sea level rise. Uh, again, uh, thinking back to uh, what I've seen about sea level rise uh, is that there's a huge uncertainty over whether the Greenland ice sheet slips away into the ocean uh, or not. And if it does, that creates a palpable huge jump in the rate of sea level rise to the point where we could see a lot of sea level rise in Vancouver by 2100. And on that cheerful note, <laughs> um, thank you, Tim. Um, I'd, I'd like to move now back to the questions. I'm sorry for having failed to do that earlier. Um, I have a question from uh, Michael Healy. Uh, oh wait, that wasn't the question that I wanted. Uh, okay, here it is. Uh, Tim said we should make, quote, all reasonable progress, unquote, in addressing climate change. Um, and then he asks, and I'm not sure Tim is going to be the one to answer this, but what does all reasonable mean in the context of a crisis like climate change? Well, right. Uh, what is reasonable? Uh, in other words, it wouldn't help if we shut off all the power plants and closed all the uh, uh, oil fields and stop driving our cars. It, it wouldn't really make any difference in the short term. Uh, and so is that reasonable? Well, probably not. Uh, but uh, the whole question of what is reasonable is what the political uh, process leads us through. And what's reasonable in a climate emergency, a long emergency that we face, really, I think, uh, depends on how we can learn to do better over time. We, uh, the reason solar and offshore wind suddenly got a lot better is in part because China started building these facilities and these, that equipment uh, uh, at a, a, a very uh, 
sharply increased rate. And we learned from that globally. And the same kind of thing can happen with our other energy technologies as well. Uh, so I guess all reasonable things uh, include trying to reduce our emissions, uh, but uh, also uh, recognizing that we do need to adapt to climate change uh, through various measures municipalities, governments, families, organizations can take, but that the threat uh, is growing. Thank you, Tim. Um, I have a question from Marcello Vega. Um, UNIPCC mentioned that 96.6% of the CO2 emissions are from natural sources. Is this correct? Hi, Marcello. Um, so, so I mentioned earlier that the, the pre-industrial carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere was 280 or so uh, parts per million. That indeed is from natural sources. The natural sources of carbon dioxide are volcanic explosions and oxidation of a whole variety of uh, carbon, molecule, uh, carbon molecules, uh, dimethyl sulfide, things like that, that come from oceans and very active ecosystems, particularly estuarine ecosystems. That those carbon emissions were in equilibrium in what is called the carbon oxygen cycle part of one of the great biogeochemical cycles. Um, and that, that equilibrium was characterized by the 280 parts per million. So that was a huge amount of carbon emission that continued all the time uh, through, through certain recent geologic past. Um, what is happening is that, that human, human action is adding a relatively small amount, but because of the long time scale of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, hundreds of years, uh, because of that, this, the accumulated amount eventually mounted up and we now have the 380 parts per million in the atmosphere. It is still only parts per million. It is a small concentration, uh, you know, oxygen is 20%, that's a, a, a very big fraction. However, because of the large amount of energy that arises from the sun that can be manipulated by atmospheric transmissivity, even the small change results in the accumulation of a large amount of energy in the atmosphere. And it is important to recognize that the current warming is correlated not with short-term emission rate of carbon dioxide, but with the total accumulated carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So if we are to reverse global warming, we would not only have to stop emitting, but we would have to find a way to draw down the current carbon dioxide to whatever level we decided was safe. Um, and, and, and that of course is a tough thing though. Tim has mentioned indeed attempts at carbon sequestration. Uh, and the problem with those is the amount of energy needed to draw the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Again, think of it as a 200, 300 parts per million. So you've got to deal with a million parts of air in order to get two or 300 parts of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere with, with whatever efficiency or chemical processes. So it is, it is difficult, but it is absolutely the accumulated carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that drives the temperature increase. Tim. Just two quick points to uh, underscore what Do just said. Uh, the way I learned to really appreciate the scale of this problem is what some of my colleagues use is called the bathtub analogy. Imagine you have an old fashioned bathtub that's completely full of water and it has one drain out the bottom and that uh, bathtub represents the carbon in the atmosphere and the drain going out the bottom, it represents the rate at which carbon is taken up in the oceans and uh, in plants and so forth on the earth. And we have a whole bunch of uh, sources of water coming into this bathtub that are coming in tens of thousands of times faster than the water goes out the bottom. That's the problem we have with the climate system. It's not just emissions, it's the concentrations. Uh, and to put an underscore on that, I heard recently on Quirks and Quarks uh, that 
if you compare the global warming contribution associated with burning a unit, say a ton of coal, the heat generated from that coal, how bad is that compared to the greenhouse gas trapping consequences? The greenhouse gas trapping consequences of burning one ton of coal are 100,000 times worse in terms of the contribution to global warming than the actual energy from the combustion. So it's like concentrations. To... That's what I've been trying to get across. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to thank the audience. A lot of people are, are giving us little bits of information um, rather than asking questions. And, and I remind you that you will be uh, going into breakout rooms where that kind of uh, information can be shared. Um, I, I have a question. I'm not sure how prepared any of you is to answer it, but I think the problem is that we seem to know a lot about the consequences of uh, human activity, but we don't seem to be talking very much about how do we convince human beings to be interested, I guess, in, in this issue. And I wondered, I, I, I know that scientists tend not to grapple with that kind of thing, but I wonder if, you know, it, how, how do we, do you have suggestions about how we start to say, look, it's not just a matter of a few changes, it's, it's really going to be a long-term and rather drastic uh, shift in, in the way we behave and think. Do. You know, Marjorie, I think this is essentially a psychological question, which is why when I mentioned my ignorance, I added psychology to it. Um, we are told by the evolutionary, evolutionary anthropologists that human, the human biology is conditioned to respond to immediate threats. You know, the lion around the other side of the, of the thorn tree. And this is a threat of an entirely different kind. It is not immediate, it is, it is long-term. How do we envisage multi-generational solutions to a threat? Uh, and surely only the psychologists will help us understand how to deal with that. I do not know of academic uh, psychologists working on this problem. I have seen a few writings by academic psychologists about why people find it difficult to conceive of climate change. I've never really seen anything that points to solutions. I'm sure Tim will have ideas on this as well. Well, yes. very briefly, there, there are many uh, psychologists who write about uh, perception and judgments regarding climate change. Um, uh, I did some work on that one time and published an article along those lines. And it, it showed that people perceive the consequences of global warming as quite worrisome and severe. On the other hand, they look at the causes of global warming or climate change as pretty much aspects of normal life. Uh, so there, we have a big disconnect between perceptions of causes and consequences. Uh, and that, I think that's shown uh, over and over. And it basically plays out in the, in, in the political uh, debates. Right, Bill. Um. Well, this is um, Extinction Rebellion has its own program to, to uh, bring awareness. Uh, and basically they do a talk which says, here are the facts. And one of their, their goals, their demands is tell the truth. So they try to present as clearly as possible what it means if there's no ice in the Arctic, you know, what that could possibly mean. If the um, jet stream stops, if it wavers and so on. So they present this, what people would call a kind of an alarmist vision of the future. Now you could say, well, you know, this could be bad, could you know, disincentivize people, but as it turns out, they have in the period of about a year gained a lot of support and ended up blocking, you know, um, London, London's bridges for five days. So the people who went to these talks and, and really listen to this, what I believe is at least a roughly accurate vision of what the science is, they are motivated. So it's really a question of making it clear 
what this means. Um, not, and you see, we always say uh, 2100, <laughs> 2100, this is gonna happen. Nobody cares. Basically nobody cares. In fact, there's a, the, the yellow vests in France would say, you're worried about the end of the world. We're worried about the end of the month. And this is, uh, you will not get um, much response about it until it becomes, until you really show what this means in real terms. And I, so that means there has to be a campaign of, to tell the truth about the science, I think. And that has to be. Thanks very much. Thanks to all of you. So these are uh, upcoming events uh, at uh, the Emeritus College. Um, so the photo group. Uh, Investments, if you're still interested in your investments, uh, the travel group. Uh, there's a senior scholar series with Jane Coop, who's a fantastic pianist. Most of you probably know that. And then the Poetic Odysseys, which is uh, a poetry group. So P newcomers are welcome if you haven't in, in, been involved in these groups before. Thanks.